I think that that any time we forgive someone when we feel deeply hurt, we have to come to a point in our lives where it's just not worth being unforgiving anymore. I have not come nearly as far as Debbie with her forg with with forgiveness. I'm still angry at the men that did this, even though one of them's dead, I'm still angry. Hello, I'm Dwight Nelson. Welcome to The Evidence. Debbie Morris's boyfriend was tortured and left for dead. She was raped multiple times by the man Sean Penn played in the film Dead Man Walking. When you've been hurt that deeply, how can you possibly forgive? It was the spring of 1980. On a typical Friday night in Madisonville, Louisiana, 16-year-old Debbie Morris was on a date with her boyfriend, Mark Brewster. It was um, very typical that we would go get a milkshake at the end of a date and drink it on the riverfront. And we did that that particular night. We went to Bado's and we got our milkshakes and we went and sat in his car on the riverfront. The evening took an unexpected turn when two armed men hijacked Mark's car. Robert Willie got in the driver's seat, Joseph Vaccaro got in the back seat and put a gun to Debbie's head. They drove out of town. It was the beginning of what would be a 30 hour ordeal. After 15 minutes of driving, they pistol whipped Mark and forced him at gunpoint into the trunk of his car. Then Robert Willie shoved Debbie into the back seat and told her to remove her clothes. And I, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I really couldn't, I couldn't imagine anything worse than, than what he was going to do to me. And all I could think about was just how awfully disgusting he was and what he was about to do to me. After Robert Willie raped Debbie, they headed east, away from Madisonville, Louisiana, away from home. As they neared Mobile, Alabama, they stopped and took Mark out of the trunk of the car and put Debbie into the trunk, telling her they were going to release Mark in the woods, then release her further down the road. As they led Mark away, Debbie prayed they would keep their promise. When I was in the trunk of the car, however, I heard the gunshots. I heard two gunshots. And I still didn't know what to think. You know, I, I could hear Robert Willie and Joseph Vaccaro come running back to the car, and they were shrieking and screaming like they were excited, like elated. When Joseph Vaccaro removed Debbie from the trunk, she asked about the gunshots. He told her they had simply fired into the air to scare Mark. Later, she found that they had hung Mark from a tree, stabbed him in the side, cut his throat, burned him with cigarettes, and shot him in the back of the head at close range. They left him for dead, then continued east towards Florida. But realizing they had no drug connections in Florida, they turned around and headed back to Louisiana. I, I felt it, you know, I knew whether it was instinctual or just knowing Debbie's history of, of responsibility, I knew something terrible had happened. By this time, they started saying, we know where we're gonna take you. We know the perfect spot. And, and Robert would say that, he would say, right, Joe, right? And he would say, yeah, that's right. We know where we're gonna take her. We have the perfect place. And I didn't know, of course, at this time that the place that they were talking about was a place called Fricky's Cave, which is where three days earlier they had taken another girl, an 18-year-old girl, and they raped her and stabbed her to death at this place. They drove down the long, isolated dirt road toward Fricky's Cave, where they probably intended to kill Debbie. But on the way, they passed an old man carrying a fishing pole. It's likely Willie feared the old man would overhear the murder. So after he raped Debbie again, 
they left Ricky's cave and went to drug dealer Tommy Holden's trailer. There, Debbie was raped yet again, this time by Joe Vaccaro. Um, I was in the, like, the little living room area, and he was down the hall, and he called me down the hall. And I thought maybe he was going to show me a way out, a back way out or something. And I went down there, and he told me um, very politely that um, it was his turn to have sex with me now. After Vaccaro violated her, Debbie was tied up so the kidnappers could sleep. In the early hours of Sunday morning, drug dealer Tommy Holden sobered up enough to realize Debbie was underage and being held against her will. He demanded she be taken home. Robert Willie initially agreed, but insisted they first destroy the hijacked vehicle. At this point, Robert started saying that, uh, Robert Willie started saying that uh, he didn't want to let me go. And uh, when Tommy Holden was frustrated, he walked back over to the car and I asked him uh, about it. I said, they don't want to let me go, do they? And he admitted that they didn't want to let me go. And I said, they want to kill me, don't they? And he said, yes, that's what they're talking about. And I heard Robert Willie say that they should just burn me up in the trunk of the car. We learned English. Your kids can too. Just watch Hello Channel. Welcome back to The Evidence. When Debbie Morris heard Robert Willie say that they should lock her inside the trunk of the car, then burn it, she decided to make a run for it. She had little hope of escape, but she knew she'd rather die by being shot than by being burned alive. I was just about to take off running when Robert Willie said, fine, we'll take her home. We'll just take her home. We're making a mistake, but we'll just take her home. And they did. As I was getting out of the car, and they were actually letting me out of the car, I thought that they were either going to shoot me or that they were going to run me over with the car. I really didn't think that they were going to let me go. And by that time, I just, I couldn't even run. I, I just was willing to let whatever was going to happen, happen. And when they drove off, I just couldn't believe it. My heart just started pounding and I just started running. She ran to her uncle's store and told him to hide with her behind the counter. She was afraid her kidnappers would come back. She grabbed the telephone off the counter and called her mom. And I told her not to tell anybody where she was going, just to get in the car and come get me. Two minutes later, Debbie's mom pulled into the parking lot. She ran out, opened the car door, and the first thing both she and her mother said was, where's Mark? Debbie knew something terrible had happened to him. She gave a detailed description to the police of where Mark had been left. They found him, barely conscious, but alive. Debbie immediately went to the hospital to see him. I could tell that Mark was relieved to see me. And he did certain things. Um, he reached up to touch my neck, my throat, because he had been cut on the throat and uh, his, his throat had been slashed several times across. And I think he was just trying to make sure that they hadn't done those things to me. I was very moved at the time by the fact that Mark was the one who was lying there in such serious condition, but he still was just concerned about me. Right after the kidnapping, we went through a period where she was terrified. For a few days after the kidnapping, just to go into the bathroom alone and shut the door would have been too much for her. I think just all of her life kind of fell apart. Uh, she changed a lot from before um, it happened. Um, she, she changed her tremendous amount. You would think that after surviving a near-death experience, you know, in my kidnapping and, and rape and all, that I would embrace life and not want to put myself back in danger. 
when it seems, you know, when I look back, it seems just the opposite. It seems like whatever they didn't do to me, I was determined to do to myself. Uh, there were times that I, you know, cried myself to sleep. I, there were times that I felt like Debbie had been so wronged and so hurt that, you know, would she ever, her life ever be okay? Every single night that I went to sleep, the last thing I thought about was, what if I wake up and he's there? My big fear was that somehow he would get out of prison. We had heard from one of the officers that he had said that if he ever got the opportunity to do so, he would cut her up so badly that even her mother wouldn't recognize her. I lived with that fear, and I believed him. And he had actually escaped from that local jail before. I had someone call me in the middle of the night, a hitman that I had no idea who he was. And he said, if you want them dead, they will be. And at the time, I said, no. You know, I believe that the process will take care of it. And thank God that I, you know, <laughs> I did believe that. During the trial, Debbie avoided eye contact with Robert Willie. On the other hand, Robert blew kisses at Debbie and made crude noises. He looked right at Mark and drew a finger across his neck. He bragged of other crimes he had committed and referred to himself as Jesse James. Like Jesse James, he was finally sentenced to death. Just the idea that there was a person who was actually going to die um, was just, it was hard to comprehend, really. And I started envisioning them walking him into this room and strapping him down on this chair. And while people watched, um, killing him. I, I wanted Robert Willie dead. I know that. At the time, I did. I don't know how I feel about that today. I thought that I would feel excited, happiness, uh, something like that. I knew by the time the execution occurred that I would not feel that. But I didn't expect th the numbness that I felt. I can remember one of the things that I hung on to was something that my father had said shortly after the kidnapping. He said, uh, you know, he said, for some reason, for Debbie to have survived this, God had a plan for her. He said something good will come out of this because otherwise she'd be dead. You know, God had a plan. And I kept trying to, to see, to realize what that plan could be. Today I know. On December 28, 1984, Robert Willie was executed. Justice may have been served. But did Robert Willie's death heal the wounds? We'll talk to Debbie Morris and her mother, Sharon Ratliff, about what came next right after this. Learn English and have fun on Hello Channel. In her book, Forgiving the Dead Man Walking, Debbie Morris recounts the story, the, the, really the chilling story of her kidnapping and subsequent ordeal. She and her mother are here to talk about that journey, a journey step by step toward forgiveness. Debbie, glad to have you. Sharon, welcome to Good the to evidence. You know, the, our last segment ended with you describing your emotions as you came closer and closer to the day of Robert Willie's execution. What was going on inside on that day? You have to understand, this was a man that I had feared since the first moment I laid eyes on him. How much time had, had gone by from that first moment till the execution? Four and a half years. Four and a half, four and a half years. years. And wow. for four and a half years, he was the first thing that I thought of when I woke up, the last thing that I thought of before I went mm. to sleep. I, I would say, please don't let him 
be standing here if I wake up in the middle of the night. I was so terrified of him. I'm sure. So, so there was this great sense of relief that, that I was hoping to feel when he was finally gone and I thought that that, would, that part of my life would be over and I wouldn't have to fear anymore. But at the same time, the closer the execution got, the more anxiety I felt about mm. it. You wake up the next morning, Debbie. What hit you when you saw that headline announced confirming the reality? I just was numb. It, like I said, it's hard to describe. Did, uh, it, did it bring the closure you were anticipating? No. Oh. No, and that would become even more evident in the days, the weeks, the months after. What happens to a person to move you to that closure? Something must have happened. You've had closure. Right, right. What's happened? What happened along the way? It, it was when I just turned back to God and sort of threw my arms up in the air and said, what's going to make this better? And, and how can you help me now? I'm, I give up. I'm willing, I'm willing to let you do it. This is just so much bigger than me. Sharon, you come to the day of execution. Robert Willie is executed. You learn of it, obviously, the next day. The anger is gone now. No. No. What goes on happening? I thought that I would get some relief. I thought that we would all be different somehow, that this would put closure on it. It really didn't. Nothing really changed. He was dead, but the feelings were still there for me. Do you still feel anger? Yes, I do still feel some anger. It's really hard for a mother to see her children hurt. And, and Debbie was severely hurt and damaged by this. It's very hard. Experientially, what happens when a person forgives? The, the whole process of forgiveness mm -hmm. happens in steps. It's not an event. A lot of people think that it's an event, and once they say, I want to forgive, I do forgive, that help me to over. forgive, that that's it. The pain goes away, everything's okay. That's not what happens. At the time, I was sort of thinking that maybe that's what would happen. But I didn't even understand hmm. forgiveness at the time. What I wanted at that point was for the hate to go away, mm -hmm. for this, I felt like I was the one who had been imprisoned for four and a half years. Robert Lee Willie may have been behind bars, but I felt like I had been in prison. I wanted that gone. I wanted to, to quit being controlled by the past, and I wanted to all of a sudden experience a freedom that would help me be able to move into the future. Mm. That's what I wanted. I wanted it all at once that night. It didn't necessarily happen like that, but it was a step. I did feel the freedom that came with that initial uh, step in forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Is your journey toward forgiveness uh, similar? or no, How did it all. happen for you? Basically, as time went by and I saw Debbie begin to recover, mm -hmm. I was able to let go of the anger mm -hmm. and begin to just be grateful that today I have my daughter sitting next to mm. me. Is forgiveness something you, you, you simply choose to do, Debbie and Sharon? You say, well, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to have to do it. It's a choice? I think it is. I think it's a choice that, that you have to consciously make. You have to set your mind to do. Forgiveness for me meant that I was no longer the one who was responsible for Robert Lee Willie's fate, for for vengeance mm, against mm -hmm, him. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness for me was very personal. It's what allowed me to be able to move on and experience God's love and grace and the peace that he would have me have. How does God, believing in God, what, what does that contribute to being able to forgive someone who has wronged you so deeply? Let, let, me, let me go to you, Sharon. I really didn't give it a lot of thought until Debbie started talking more mm. about forgiveness. And one day I thought about God on the cross, mm. Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, his last words were, forgive them. Mm. How could I not? Debbie, God and you, how did that make forgiving easier? One of the things that, that really got my attention was when uh, it says in the Bible that, that we will be forgiven as we are willing to forgive mm -hmm. others. 
And when I took a look at my life, and over the four and a half years during, after my kidnapping and before Robert Will Willie's execution, and even some time after that, I had really made a mess of my life, mm. and I needed to be forgiven by God. Mm. I needed to be forgiven by God mostly for turning my back on Him for four and a half years and blaming Him for what happened to me. So forgiveness, essentially, you're describing a two-way process. It's not just me forgiving the whole world that has wronged me, but I need to seek forgiveness myself as a surviving human exactly, being. Exactly, exactly. And for, for instance, for Robert Lee Willie, to benefit from forgiveness. It wasn't my forgiveness that he needed. It was God's forgiveness. Debbie, Sharon, thank you very much for coming here and sharing the story of your journey to forgiveness. God bless you both. Thank you. Thanks. There's more to Debbie's story. You mm -hmm. can be sure of that. In fact, we have it on our website, The Subject of Forgiveness, the expansion of her story. You can go to our website right now. It's just one word, theevidence.org.org. I'm going to be back in just a few moments with some concluding thoughts. Thanks for watching Hello Channel, the fun, affordable way to learn English. One thing that intrigues me about Debbie Morris's remarkable story is the motivation behind her act of forgiveness. Debbie tells us she did this not because the man who assaulted her somehow deserved her pardon. She did it for her own good. In her book, she writes that a refusal to forgive would have meant hanging on to her pain, to her shame, to her self-pity. Debbie forgave in order to find healing. For her, it came as a gift from God. Now, it's true, forgiveness, whether divine or human, doesn't justify the terrible things that happen to us. Nor is forgiveness a way of pretending it wasn't so bad after all. It's a way of finally being set free from the hurt. Forgiveness is a divine way to take back our lives. That's what I think. I'm Dwight Nelson. Join us next time for more of The Evidence.